Good morning. Good morning. I don't normally uh, put any kind of date into these talks. It's kind of like the the author that writes a suspense novel and is constantly talking about current events and then in 20 years someone says, no, nah, I don't like them because they're very dated, you know, because everything hinges on stuff that happened a long time ago. But um, I just wanted to get the word out that on the 15th of July we will have our Golan ceremony here, which in Japanese is Olon, and in Sanskrit is Ulambana. It's the Vietnamese uh, Mother's Day, and it's also the time where you remember people who have passed in this year and previous years. And so it's, it's a very important day, and it's also the, uh, technically the last day of the summer training or the rains season training for the monks. So it begins with a, normally begins with the Buddha's birthday and ends with uh, the celebration of uh, Ulan, and um, so it brackets in the 90-day period of the monks advanced training. We are looking at the Bodhisattva precepts right now, and the Japanese take these precepts, and for the most part, that's all they take. There are 48 precepts, and uh, some people here have taken them. There's 10 of the cardinal precepts, and I'm sorry, I said 48, it's 58, and then 48 of the minor precepts. It covers a lot of ground. And uh, we were talking about this today, but I'll do it for an audience that's on YouTube or wherever our, our head monk has put this in social media. Um, when Buddhism went into Japan in the 8th century, the founder of the Jendai school decided that the monks did not need to follow the Pratimoksha, which was the uh, rules of conduct for monks, and uh, which we normally call the Vinaya. And the Vinaya covers a whole lot of ground because the Buddha might have said, oh, I don't think you got to do that, and then that becomes a rule for monks, but it's not necessarily in the Pratimoksha, which are the 250 rules that monks must follow. So there's a lot. And I think sometimes uh, in Asia, the monks get uh, too worried about the rules and they spend all their time thinking about the rules and uh, they don't really have a practice. It's just, okay, I gotta make sure I don't do this, make sure I don't do that. <clears throat> When I went to study with Thich Tienan, the Vietnamese Zen master, one of the things I noticed right away was the fact that there was no talk of enlightenment like that happened in a lot of the American Japanese centers. It, it rarely was talked about. It, it wasn't that nobody could talk about it, it just was rarely talked about. And one of the things that was never talked about was the attainment of another person. And I came to understand that this was maybe the Chinese influence on the, the Vietnamese because they were a Chinese protectorate for a very long time. And you'll never catch a Chinese monk saying, oh yes, he's very enlightened. Well, that one over there, they're, they're a little enlightened and that one there is completely deluded. <laughs> uh, they just simply don't do that. And in the Bodhisattva precepts, one of the cardinal precepts is not to, to uh, self grandizement Don't talk about what a wonderful attainment you have and run down the attainment of other people. And I always think of Ben Franklin when I read that precept because he said the cheapest form of a compliment is to run somebody else down. And, uh, we have that in Buddhism, that we really should not step on that dangerous ground. Uh, we should just encourage everybody. And Tiamon taught me very early on in the game, it was not about accomplishment, it was about effort. And the more effort somebody makes, the more they should be admired. And the less effort makes, we should encourage them. There should be no criticism about how much they're doing. I 
set the stage for what I'm going to say now. Uh, periodically, American monks get into trouble. Uh, just like periodically Catholic priests get into trouble. And sometimes it really colors the way everything's looked at. That, oh, well, maybe Buddhism isn't such a good path to follow because, look, they got into trouble. That's really not a very uh, smart way of looking at it. The proper way to look at it is, oh, well, they're human and they got into trouble. They didn't get into trouble because of the Buddhism. Really, they got in trouble because of their lack of understanding. Now, let's talk about enlightenment because we never talk about enlightenment, okay? Enlightenment does not cure your bad habits. The Buddha did not have any bad habits because the Buddha wandered around in the forest and he was up in the Himalayas and, and caves studying with teachers. And by the time he woke up, it was almost impossible for him to break the precepts that good Buddhists try to keep. Now I say try because we understand and the Buddha taught us that everybody is human. This, this notion of perfection is an ideal. It's a very romantic idea that doesn't exist in reality. There is nobody that's perfect. And I'll give you one just very simple example that there is nobody that's perfect. If there were people that were perfect, they couldn't sell deodorant, nobody would buy it. Right? Because wouldn't perfect be that you don't smell? And there wouldn't be any dentist because you do such a good job of brushing your teeth that you'd never, ever, ever, ever need to go to a dentist. So the notion of perfect is really just an ideal. Rob, our master carpenter, will tell you that the ideal is to do the very best you can. And because you make a very good effort, a strong effort, to be the best you can at what you're doing, people will look and go, that's perfect. Because they have nothing to compare it to. But in our mind, we have this notion that is, you know, a diamond is flawless. They're almost or no flawless diamonds, I've read. They all have some little tiny thing going on with them, but the less flaws they have, the more valuable they are. We, we fall into this trap that we think. Now, these teachers that I'm talking about, I'm not going to go into this. They, uh, they had bad habits that they never cured. And they had bad habits that they never dressed. And one of them got kicked out of his temples, got kicked out of his temple. Those of you that follow the gossip in Buddhism will know who I'm talking about. He had a temple down in Florida and he got kicked out. And then he had a temple in Utah, Salt Lake City, and he got kicked out. And uh, just go on the internet and say, Zen master who got kicked out of his temple. We'll get a couple of choices in there. The second time he got kicked out, he said, oh, I've got problems and I have to get help. It would be very reasonable to say, you should have got help the first time you had the same problems. They aren't magically going to go away. It's kind of like an alcoholic that says, oh, no, I'm not an alcoholic. I'll, I'll just drink less. Yeah, that works really good. Okay. Uh, there are things in life that we cannot fix ourselves. And alcoholism is one of them. We cannot fix that ourselves. We can decide we need to fix it. And only we can decide to do that. And when we decide to do that, then we go to a group that's going to help us and encourage us. And we get a sponsor. And then, with a little bit of luck and a lot of effort, we might not fall off the wagon too many times because we're human beings. And alcohol and alcoholism is not a habit. I'm talking about habits. Alcoholism is not a habit. Alcoholism is a predisposition. I firmly, absolutely believe that it's genetic. And I say this with 
enormous conviction because my entire family is an alcoholic. The last one was caught. The last alcoholic was caught sneaking drinks. And I just heard about it last week when I went to lunch with my alcoholic sister, who's been sober many years, who told me that he had been caught and his wife told him very simply, I did not sign up for this. You need to get help. Okay? A good alcoholic can hide it for a long time. But we could call it a habit. You get in the habit of hiding things. But other things, that's addiction. Addiction is terribly hard to, to correct alone. This is why the Buddha has a Sangha. The Sangha are the people who encourage us when we have things we can't do alone. But there are other bad habits that we can have that we can, we can tackle ourselves. But it's always good to have someone to encourage us. It's always good to have a sponsor who says, you're doing that again. I had this habit. I want to do it right now. Uh, for years, I snorted. Nobody told me about it. I'm not even going to do it for you because once I do it, then I'll want to do it all day long. <laughs> and, and I had no idea I was doing it because I did it all the time. That was a habit. And that was a habit that had become so internalized that I was never aware of the fact that I was doing it. Now, looking back, I understand why. Okay, I, all my life I've had my, my Achilles tendon, my weakness was my sinuses. And when I lived in uh, L.A. County, where it was smoggy seven days a week, I had headaches six days a week. My sinuses would close up where I had, and they would swell up in my face. And I started using that stuff you squirt up in your nose to open up your nose so you can breathe. And that's why I was snorting. I couldn't breathe. I wasn't snorting because I was a bad person. <laughs> I was doing that because I... But finally, kept, someone kept pointing it out to me, and I went, and I kept trying to control it, and I realized the problem was I couldn't breathe. The best day I ever had was the day we moved to the desert. And I got up here, and I started working, and we'd been up here a couple of weeks, and I realized I could breathe. I, I didn't have headaches anymore, and I could breathe. And I'd already been told by a doctor that I was allergic to smog. So I got in this bad habit. Probably what I should have done is gone back to the doctor and got the, some more of the medicine he gave me, which fixed the problem. But, you know, when you're a hardhead and you think you know better than other people, it takes a few decades for it to sink in that perhaps they know something that you don't know. We have the precepts. The precepts are very important. They're to help us have good habits. The first precept is always considered the most important precept. It's not to take life. Now, everybody in this room has taken a life. And everybody in this room will continue to take a life. If you get sick and you go to the doctor and you're maybe even ready to die and the doctor gives you an antibiotic, you're taking life. The Buddha taught as monks that when you drink water, you're you're taking lives because there's little little guys floating around in that water you can't see. So you're taking a life. Vegetarians, and you know vegetarians because some of you are, and you're much holier than everybody else. Every time you go out and you get some vegetables or you get some fruits, you're taking a life. And there's no way to escape it. Anytime you take, eat an apple, you've taken a life because, I mean, my gosh, you know, the, the re Republicans would just beat you to death over this because that's an abortion. You've been aborted an apple tree. <laughs> Think about it. I know it sounds silly, but, you know, we cannot move through life without affecting other life. And anytime we eat a fruit and consume those seeds, now the birds are different. Figs love birds because figs have spread all over the world because of birds, because the birds eat them and they can't digest the seeds. 
and as they're flying along, oh, we're spreading seeds, look at this. It's just, it's just like I have a crop duster. Here go the seeds <laughs> for the figs. But if we interrupt this, the life cycle, this morning I went out and got, you have to look, Mary, in the kitchen. Did you see it? I planted a new kind of winter squash. I can't even remember what it is. Because I, I got it, because I like winter squash. It makes great soup. This thing is that big, and it's got to weigh 25 pounds. I could barely pick it up. Barely pick this thing up. I kept letting it grow because I thought, you know, usually the stem on a squash will kind of get a little, a little weak. It'll start to shrivel, and you know it's time to harvest it. Well, this had a stem the size of my wrist, you know, and it was laying there, and I thought. Holy mackerel, how big could this possibly get? Look at it. You could feed 100 people off of this one squash. Okay? Anytime we go out and we, we consume fruit, or vegetables rather, that have seeds inside of them, any of the melons, there, we can see them. I love tomatoes. I've got a monk that is, I don't know what his problem is. We went to the garden shop. We bought four different tomatoes. He wanted tomatoes because he says the ones in the stores don't taste good and you grew up on a farm. So we planted four different types of tomatoes. And then when I wasn't looking, he went back and bought two more. <laughs> he's afraid he's not going to have enough tomatoes to eat. Okay, Thursday night meditation, he comes in with a big bowl of tomatoes and says, here, have some tomatoes. They're really great. Okay, tomatoes full of seeds. We eat the seeds. They're never going to, those babies aren't going to grow. It's impossible for us to move through life without affecting another life. So we have to accept that. And sometimes I've heard people argue, they love, you know, everybody loves to argue and it's philosophical. Well, you know, why, is, why are human beings more important than cockroaches? We should hold cockroaches in the same self-esteem that we hold a human being. But yet the Buddha taught to take a human life, well, first of all, to take the life of a, an enlightened being is the worst thing you can do. Of course, the, the idea behind that is that an enlightened being no longer can teach other people and help them along the way. To kill your parents is the next, either one of your parents, is the next worst thing you could possibly do. And then it just goes to human beings in general to take the life of any human. This is why Buddhists traditionally are never in favor of capital punishment. I'm certainly not in favor of it. It doesn't work. And it's not punishment. You're not punishing someone when you end their life. It's over with. They're, they move on to another life. And from a practical standpoint, it costs like, I don't know, this one could probably tell us. I've read it over and over again. It costs three or four times as much money to execute someone as it does to put them in a prison and keep them there for the rest of their life. And all we're doing is protecting society. This is my feeling. If you have someone that cannot live in society without killing people, then you need to isolate them so they don't hurt other people. They don't need to be punished. They're defective human beings. That's the way I, that's my personal opinion. I, I can't give you any scientific evidence because, you know, you can't necessarily go to court and, and claim insanity because you're defective. But I can't imagine how anybody can walk into, like this guy that walked into an office and, and shot five people and killed them and injured over 20 people. How could anybody think he's sane? Well, okay, I don't want him to get off of I want him to be put away somewhere where he can't do that to anybody again. That's all. I don't even want him punished because it doesn't work. The Buddha said that 2,500 years ago. He said you can't change people by hating them. You can only change people by loving them. He said it doesn't work. You can go get a stick and beat on people every day and you're not going to make them any better. So we're all going to take life. We're all going to gossip. I just got done gossiping. I encourage you to go on the internet and look up this guy that thinks he's a real Zen master and just can't seem to control his urges. Okay? 
okay? He never worked on his urges. I watched him on YouTube two days ago. I had a friend that hooked my TV up so it would have YouTube on it. Incredible. I have avoided Utah. Do you know that all, Mary, do you know that all 38 of uh, the rainbow shows that Pete Seeger did in the 50s is on YouTube? It is. It is. It's fabulous. 48 minutes long. He's got everybody in the world that was a singer back then of folk music. I've been watching those. Wow. <laughs> so I went on to YouTube and there was a, there was a, a title. Somehow we, we got over to Zen. I don't know why it got over to Zen. But we're on YouTube. You know, this will be on YouTube. And when our head monk talks, it'll be on YouTube. And when, when our, our uh, tomato monk, <laughs> <laughs> That's the name he should have got. He's got his monk, monk's name. He gives a talk, which you're pretty good. It'll be on YouTube. And uh, I saw this thing and it said, How to be a Zen master. And I thought, Oh, really? Oh, five easy steps to be a Zen master or something. And here's this guy that's been in trouble for the last couple of years now. And I found out what his problem was. And it made me think I needed to talk about discipline. This talk right here. I actually thought about this talk before I started talking. I never think about my talks. I try, I always go to Sandy and I say, what should I talk about next week? Oh, anything you say, it's just fine. That's her answer, you know. And so I never can get anybody to help me on this, you know. What, what, what should I, Rick, what should I talk about next week? Oh, I don't know. I think you need to look inward to yourself and figure that out. <laughs> oh, this is a lot of help. And, you know, 44 years of giving talks, and you guys expect me to keep coming up with stuff. But I saw this thing on YouTube after I'd watched Pete Seeger play his long neck banjo, and I thought, you know I bought a long neck banjo, don't you? Oh, yeah, I did. I finally, it took me almost two years to talk myself into doing that. But I bought one. And this guy came on and he talked about having an awakening experience before he was a monk, when he was having problems in his life, his girlfriend and him weren't getting along, and other stuff was not going the way he wanted. He'd been to college already, he was in his 20s. And he went out into the desert here with a couple friends and they wandered off and he had this experience. And from the sounds of it, what he did is he stopped thinking about himself for a moment. Very self-absorbed guy. And it was such a, a, a unique experience for him and he probably was right up in here. As he said, I went up into the California desert he lived in L.A., so where are you going to go? Maybe Palmdale. You know? And he says, no, and I had my first enlightenment experience. No, you didn't. You actually had a moment when you stopped thinking about yourself and realized there was something else in the world besides you. That's not enlightenment. <laughs> okay. It would be nice if it was, but... And what he never did was he never put himself into discipline. Now, back when I was a high school teacher, I used to tell the kids, discipline is, because it, we, we'd get into that. We'd get into this thing about discipline. You know, discipline is doing homework for a high school student. They got a lot of other things that are important to do besides homework. Right, Sandy? And they can come up with them. They're endless. They just, all these things they come up with that they need to do up before they can do homework. Discipline is doing what you don't want to do, period. That's my definition. In the military, which I was in for a while, they talk about discipline. You always hear about it, you know, in the military, it's got to be discipline. Well, you think all those guys that got drafted during the Vietnam War wanted to be there? No. No, some of them actually got on a bus and got out of town. But they went ahead and did it because they felt that they had an obligation to their family, to their country, to themselves, to the world, whatever it was. And so they put up with stuff that was not a lot of fun. That's discipline. And we lack that. 
I have to tell you, we are the most spoiled people in the world. We really are. Why do we have a hard time staying on a diet? Look at Rob. Rob is getting skinnier and skinnier and skinnier. And I'm so jealous of him. He just keeps getting skinnier. And I'm not, I'm not going to ask him today how much he weighs now because I don't want to know. You know, I lost four pounds, Rob. <laughs> and you've lost like 34. <laughs> but that's, that's all discipline is. Discipline is getting up in the morning when you don't want to get up. Lots of adults have that have to deal with discipline. You know, they kids think that when they get out of high school they can sleep in all day. Which of course they find out they can't. They think that they can eat anything they want to eat. I used to tell my high school kids, I said, you, you can't eat at McDonald's anymore. McDonald's is horrendously expensive. You're going to be working minimum wage. And I would talk to them. I really did. I'd say go out and buy 10 pounds of potato. Okay? Buy a bag, small bag of rice. Get some noodles. Okay? There's your foundation right there. Now you got some food. Now you can put some stuff on this. You know, and you can make meals for yourself. You've got to learn to cook. Oh, I don't know how to cook. Well, and probably your mom doesn't know how to cook because we're a TV generation, TV dinner generation. I remember when those came out. Um, but that's discipline. And people get into trouble all the time. I listen to the radio. When I'm driving places, I, I listen to this channel and they have advertisements for this outfit that's going to help you with your credit card debt. And I, and I love the commercial because the commercial says, do you know, nobody wants you to know, but you don't have to pay your credit card debt. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big secret, right? They're not going to let you know that you don't have to get, well, you don't have to pay your credit card debt. You can go to Montana, find a grave, grave site of some poor child that died at the age of four, take their name and get their social security number, Never come home to your family again. You know, live in some obscure little village in, in, in South Dakota. Take on a new identity and you don't have to pay your credit card debt. But they say it like it's a law. Oh, you're protected. No. If you can talk them into not charging you the $20,000 you ran up on your credit card, I always think, why did they even give you a credit card? But, you know, that's between... It's discipline. It's all about discipline. It's about knowing that you can't pay that bill, so don't make that bill. We went, we went through this recession, which you're now calling the Great Recession, that I kept calling the Depression, because people went out and bought houses they couldn't afford to pay for. You know, the average person is not stupid. The average person can sit down with a pencil and a piece of paper and figure out, you know, I have I have this amount of money left over after I pay rent. Well, maybe I could I could afford a mortgage payment that was my rent and this amount of money. But we went out there and we listened to other people, but it's still our fault. Some guy said, oh no, no problem. And that's what you wanted to hear, so you went along with it. There's no problem. No, you can eat and drink. And, and just do any old thing you want to do, and it's going to have no effect on the world around you. And, and now you join the stupid club. Everything you do has an effect. Remember the movie, The Butterfly Effect? I thought that was a great movie. I think everybody missed the whole point. They go, because, you know, science came along and said nothing happens in the universe. And, well, the truth is nothing happens in the universe that doesn't affect everything doesn't necessarily mean that a butterfly is going to cause a catastrophe. But everything affects everything else. If you're angry when you're driving down the road, you see the effects of your anger real quick. Okay? When you walk into a room of people who are happy and you're unhappy, if you would pay attention, your condition, even if it's a room full of people you don't know, affects those people. We went to an event yesterday for a friend of mine. His master died 10 years ago. He was a very important monk in Vietnam, had many, many disciples, abbot temples, ran organizations for 
all the right reasons. And we figured that there were at least 150 monks and nuns going on 200 there. It was the biggest group I'd ever seen. Just huge. And I went to a, I went to a retreat the last couple of years where there were around 175 monks and nuns. I think there was maybe 200 there. It was just overwhelming. And there was one monk there they talked to. And he looked like this. <laughs> and that's what they talked about today. Did you see him? He came up to me and asked me how long I'd been a monk. And I told him, and he said, oh, I'm ahead of you. One guy. And these monks all were aware of him because of his attitude. There were lots of monks and nuns there that were smiling. By the time it was over with, they were tired, but they were still smiling. Buddhism is about smiling. You know, Nyan Han, who I don't necessarily agree with all the things he says, you know, he tells his disciples, when you wake up, the first thing you should do is smile. Yeah, come over and try to get me to smile until I've had my first cup of coffee. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not, I'm not scowling. I'm just kind of numb. I've got to get that first cup of Vietnamese coffee in me and then everything starts to work again. All the old circuits fire and all that. I got tomato monk over here. He walks around all morning with a hot cup full of coffee, you know, one of those thermal cups because that keeps him going. Discipline's hard stuff. If you look at the five precepts, it's hard to keep them. If it wasn't hard to keep them, why would we even take them? It wouldn't make any sense. You know, if you're always good, nobody would have to tell you, be good. Right? Your mother would never say, now be good now. Be good for your grandma. Be good for the babysitter. If everybody was just always naturally good, you know, we, we like to say children are basically innocent and they're good all the time. Children are innocent, and they're not good all the time. Okay, Dennis the Menace, who everybody laughs. I love Dennis the Menace since the first time I ran the comic strip. That's exactly what children are like. Last week in the little comic strip for Dennis the Menace, he's hanging off the banister, and his mom's standing there with her hands on his knee, on her, on her hips, and he's saying, well, why don't you just tell me the things I can do? You know, because kids are always stretching the boundaries to see what they can get away with. You know what? Adults are always stretching the boundaries to see what they can get away with. Years ago, I had a group of monks I was training who have all gone off and sowed seeds in the world. And I had to go. I just had to go. And there was no way. We had a retreat, and I couldn't get out of it. And I had to go into town for three, four hours. And I said to the head monk back then, I said, OK, just follow the schedule. I can't get out of this. I've got to go. Just follow the schedule. You know, the schedule was, okay, we have an hour and a half of meditation, and we take a break, and then we go do this and that. But I come back. They're all sitting around. They got, a cup, they got their knees crossed. They're sitting there. They got a cup of coffee. They got the box of cookies out. Okay, there was one Vietnamese lady there, and I, I missed her because I haven't seen her in so many years. Her name was Padma, which means lotus. And... Uh, she was a real, real interesting lady. Boy, she just get in and take charge. And the minute I left, she said, oh, we don't need to do that. We need to talk about Buddhism. And I think that monk, who's no longer with us, so I can say his name, was Nagachita. He said, well, you know, what she wants is, he said, oh, no, 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 no. He does it too much. Too much meditation. Too much meditation. We need to talk. We need to get, get a cup of coffee and talk about Buddhism. And I walk in, and there they are. I go, what are you guys doing? Oh, well, we were talking about this or that, whatever they were talking about. And I said, well, oh, okay. So you're, you're finished with your meditation and you decided, I think they were supposed to go out and kind of rake up around the place. You're done raking? Oh, no, we haven't got to that yet. I said, really? You've been talking for three hours? Well, yeah, it was important stuff. You know, we had important stuff to talk about. Just, just like a kid. And I made the axiom and I keep threatening that I'm going to get a piece of wood and a chisel and I'm going to carve it in it. 
you know, while the master's away, the monks were playing. And I've read accounts of masters, you know, a thousand years ago, the same issue. They would go away from the temples and the monks go, oh, we can get up whenever we want to. Yeah, we don't have to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning anymore. We'll just sleep in and, and then we'll see if there's anything in the kitchen to eat. I met this man two weeks ago. I had to present a paper that I was asked to write on they're trying to establish a Buddhist college in Orange <coughs> County that will be fully accredited. So if somebody gets a bachelor's degree, they can go off and get a master's degree somewhere else, that kind of stuff. It's a great idea. It's long overdue, considering uh, you know how many monks there are in Orange County and, of course, San Jose. And this monk got up, and at first, at first I thought he was very young because I saw him at a distance, and it turned out he was probably close to my age. And he had spent time in AHG, a number of years in AHG, and he described it to the Vietnamese. And I thought it was great because he was talking about how they never got it. You know, we have our, this illusion about Zen practice in Japan. You never got enough to eat. You never got enough sleep. You, you know, you never got enough of this. You never got enough of that. And as he's talking, I'm going, huh. It was a little bit different description of this Japanese monastery that I had been told about. You're always a little hungry, you're always tired, you're always this, you're always that. And when he got done, he says, but there's a lesson there. And I knew exactly what the lesson was. I had my lesson in basic training. You never get enough to eat, you never get enough sleep, you got a former Marine here. You know, once you go through that, he'll never tell you it was good. No, no, he'll never tell you that. But that's why it leaves the mark on you. You learn that you don't have to always eat until you're sleepy. That you don't always have to have eight hours of sleep. That you don't always have to be comfortable. That you can be really uncomfortable and still survive. And the Buddha said that. Okay? That was the whole thing. He says, you don't have to go out in the forest and live like I live, but you don't have to overindulge. That's why we're going to take things in moderation. And when you see yourself overindulging, you need to pull back. Whatever it is you're overindulging is, kids today are, are addicted to YouTube on their phone, walking down the street, running in the poles. I've seen two kids do it. I think everybody's now seen somebody on their phone walk into something, okay? We need to put the phone away for a while and have phone time. My mother, who probably was a genius, had a very simple approach to raising children. Get out. <laughs> we, yeah, we could come in for lunch and then get out and play. But I want to watch cartoons. No. She'd let us watch cartoons Saturday morning. And then we had to get out. Okay. Our kids are obese. Why? They need to get out. They need to climb trees and fall out of them and break their arms and, you know, do this and sprain their wrists and do all this kind of stuff. And that's called growing up. And it's also learning that they don't have to have everything they want the moment they want it. And we let them get away with it because we do that to ourselves. How often have you denied yourself something because you really don't need it? Not very often. Once you get out there and you're making a decent paycheck, you go, well, you know, I really want that. I think I'll win. You know, it was longer than two years that I thought about a long neck banjo. Okay. It was a long time, but then I had to talk myself into it for two years. You know, that I could leave it to Rob, you know, because I know Rob loves banjo. Yeah, he's just got them all over your house. But it's about discipline. And following the path is about discipline. Precepts are discipline. They're giving yourself a little meditation every day. You don't need a lot. You really don't. 
if you're doing it every day, 20 or 30 or 40 minutes is, is good. It gets you started to where you start paying attention to what you're doing. Paying attention you need a lot of. Okay, that's important. Anybody notice our new Buddha? What? What? <laughs> <laughs> we just got this Buddha that is huge and it's sitting over against the wall waiting to be installed on an altar that's too high for it. But paying attention, yeah, that's a daily thing. That's part of discipline. Not pulling back from the world when the world isn't what we want to see. You know, right now as a society, we're a mess. Everybody's calling everybody else names. Everybody is telling everybody else to go hurt somebody. It needs to be fixed. And if we back away from it and pretend it's not happening, nothing's going to get fixed. You know, I can't battle with this thing here. <laughs> <laughs>